Take my bride, let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of the speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. In the early days of the automobile, many new automakers faced a problem. They did not have the means to make every jot and tittle of the car. So the vast majority of car factories purchased many components and assemblies from other companies to put into their brand new automobiles. From tires to engines, lights to gauges, companies stepped up to supply the auto industry around the globe. And there was one American company that invented the perfect bearing for the wheels on cars, and at one point supplied the vast majority of car bearings found on all brand new cars manufactured anywhere in the world. So, although they did not make cars, they're just too important of a force in the vintage car era for me not to tell the early history of Timken. The story begins in 1831 with the birth of Heinrich Timken in the town of Bremen, Germany, into a farming family. The family emigrated to the U.S. in 1838, eventually getting a farm in Sedalia, Missouri. Young Heinrich would switch to being called Henry within a few years after arriving in St. Louis. He left the farm in 1847 and traveled to St. Louis, where Henry entered into an apprenticeship as a carriage builder. By 1855, he was ready and opened his own carriage building company, also in St. Louis. It was extremely successful, as he invented the Timken Buggy Spring, a well-engineered suspension system for light carriages commonly used at the time. By the time of his early retirement in 1887, at the ripe age of 56, Timken was a household name amongst the carriage builders of the USA and beyond. Henry retired to his substantial estate in San Diego, leaving his two sons, H. H. Timken and W. R. Timken, to run the business. But Henry was far too energetic to just stay retired for long. After so much experience in making suspensions and axles for carriages, he identified the biggest weak point on any carriage are the bearings in the axles. And at that point in history, there were only two options. The oldest technology was the plane bearing or journal bearing. In this type of bearing, two, two round tubes are simply placed one inside the other as tightly as possible, yet still allowing them to spin. It certainly is easy to make, but also noisy, requires much maintenance, and must grow exponentially larger as the weight they carry increases, making them impractical in most large and heavy vehicles. The other technology was the ball bearing. Ball bearing technology was found on the Nemi ships dating back to the first century AD, and Leonardo da Vinci also had a design for a ball bearing in his sketchbook, though it was never built. They started to appear commercially in the late 18th century and continued to develop into the 19th. In these bearings, metal balls separate the metal tubes that are one inside the other. It greatly reduces friction, but it also makes them more fragile. Ball bearings had been used on carriages and wagons in the late 19th century, but they were the exception, not the norm. If the downward force placed on the ball bearing from the wheel is consistent, all is well. However, the moment you add lateral force to the equation, you're creating torsion, and the ball bearings don't like that. This torsion can be caused by turning, road conditions, and even the bearing no longer being secure in a wooden wheel. Well, back to our story. Henry pondered the issue, traveling to Europe to get inspired. He found the inspiration in the bicycle. Bikes of the 1890s had ball bearings, and they worked. Much of the torsion that was an issue on a carriage wasn't as pronounced. When a bike turns, the rider leads into the turn, thus reducing torsion. Also, the hubs that the bearings were placed in were all steel, and so keeping the bearing secure became more reliable. In 1892, Henry came out of retirement and returned to St. Louis and to his sons and said, Sons, we're going to start a new business. We're going to invent a true anti-friction bearing. One of the sons, H.A., was the engineer-minded, so Henry took him to Europe for some six months to show him what he had seen and also so that they could bounce ideas off of each other. 
1895 was important in the history of Timken. They were still heavy into the carriage business, and the new bearing division was still just experimenting with various concepts, when Henry was asked to be one of the officiating judges at America's first sponsored auto rally, the Chicago Times-Herald race. Despite the race itself having quite a few issues, Henry saw the future, that it was only a matter of time before these newfangled automobiles replaced the carriage, and he'd better be ready for that day. The breakthrough came in 1898 with the invention of the Timken tapered roller bearing. In these revolutionary bearings, the space between the two spinning pipes was angled, and instead of balls, these were replaced with rollers that they themselves were somewhat cone-shaped to better distribute weight. The result was the ultimate frictionless bearing. It could handle far more weight and still keep spinning. They greatly reduced overall friction and could handle all of the different forces that push on a wheel bearing from all directions. The new bearing went into full production the following year and the Timken Roller Bearing Axle Company was truly born. Their first customer was a local company, the St. Louis Motor Car Company, who began buying the bearings in 1899. Uh, though the fact that George Doris was his next door neighbor you know, also helped. Uh, you can check out uh, episode 35 for more on that story. Henry retired to San Diego, but never actually resigned from the company. He remained at that post until his death in 1909, sending many letters back and forth to his sons on what he wanted to be done at his company. Late in 1901, Timken decided to leave St. Louis and resume operations in Canton, Ohio. Timken as a company was rapidly becoming the nation's largest manufacturer of bearings by this time. Their largest customer, the Winton Company, was located in Cleveland, which was nearby Canton. Northeast Ohio was a major hub of the iron and steel industry where they were already purchasing most of their raw materials, and also that the Canton Board of Trade promised that if they paid for the development, they'd give them the land. $50,000 later, they had a 12,000 square foot facility and 50 employees. The following year, they were just about broke. The main disadvantage to the Timken bearings at the time is that they were very expensive to make and thus were considerably more expensive than contemporary ball bearings. No problem for the car industry, but why would you put $20 worth of bearings and axles into a $50 carriage? It didn't make sense, and so they didn't sell. The other problem was, although the car companies loved them, the industry itself wasn't growing at the pace they expected. In 1903, Papa Henry bailed them out, gave them a $200,000 shot in the arm, but on one condition. Half of that money had to be spent on advertising. Henry had experience doing this, inventing a very useful product for an industry with his buggy spring and waging the biggest ad campaign he could muster. It was a major contributor to his success before, and he believed it would work for Timken bearing an axle. And he was right. By 1909, the company's facility had grown fivefold, as did their market presence. But the year prior, in 1908, both General Motors and Ford Motor Company announced that they were going to make themselves all components of their products, bearings and all. So in 1909, Timken made a few changes to make buying their bearings and axles a more attractive proposition than for the manufacturers to do it themselves. First, they separated the company into two, creating Timken Detroit Axle Company with W.R. Timken at the helm. H.H. remained in Canton to run the bearing company. They also made their first step in truly being a global company that same year, founding British Timken Limited in partnership with the munitions company Vickers. This made the bearings more readily available in European markets and, of course, increased sales. HH was able to sell General Motors on their bearings, but not Ford. It would take a world war to convince him. World War I began in Europe in 1914, and since the Allies had access to Timken bearings, they used them. The armies that used Timken lauded them for their ruggedness, smoothness, and reliability. The European demand became so great that Timken opened two new plants in France and one in Germany as soon as the war was over. But Ford gave two objections. They were still too expensive, and Ford didn't want to have only one source for their product needs. HH had solutions. They had been experimenting with some new technology to streamline the process of making their rollers and reduce waste. 
making them cheaper to make and they could pass the savings on to Ford. The second part of the solution was to build an additional plant in Columbus, Ohio. With that in place, if the Canton plant can't get the job done for whatever an unforeseen reason, the Columbus plant can. Thus, Ford wouldn't technically be relying on a single supplier. Ford bought, and by the end of the First World War, Timken was the largest bearing manufacturer in the world and supplied bearings to some 80% of the automotive industry worldwide. They are still a dominant force in the bearing industry and uh, supply both new car makers and the aftermarket with state-of-the-art bearing technology. So when you consider that after the First World War, almost every vintage car on any road anywhere had Timken bearings, you can see just how important they are to vintage car history. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History and we'll see you next week. Peace.